great offering talk from Georgina. Wow. I was walking through the BMW garage the <laughs> other day and I saw a Series 5 Sport soft top and I couldn't afford it. And if you want to put the car keys under my chair next week, I want you to know I will not be grumbling. I will not be complaining that God has... Ble no, listen, that was great. And whoever did that, now I don't have to buy it. Good on you. Keep that flowing, Lord. Well, today we kind of conclude our Snakes and Ladders series. I'll introduce it uh, a little bit more in a minute. Um, and then next week, we've got a couple of things, wild cards over the next few weeks. Nilton, you need to sort this out because it's a bit echoey and I don't want people feeling distracted. And, um, and then we are going to go into a whole bunch of studies on the book of Colossians. We're going to work through the book of Colossians, um, building up to uh, our summer... I nearly said our Christmas program. It's not that build up to our summer program. Um, if you've not been part of Kings the last few weeks, um, we're doing a series called Snakes and Ladders. And when you were a kid, you probably played these games. There wasn't Nintendo or Atari or PlayStation 27. You played games like this where you roll the dice and if you, got, you move forward and what happens if you landed on a snake, what happened? Let's do this like it's a bit more like Britain's Got Talent. When you land on a snake, what happens? And, uh, and then also, if you land on a ladder, what happens? So we have been looking at things in the Christian life that take us down and things that lift us up. And we've been looking, asking people from their experiences of, of their Christian walk to look at certain things that have taken them forward and moved them forward in the journey, but also to look at things that have taken us back. Now, in the culmination of this series in this morning, I want to do my same snake is the same as my ladder. Because I want to talk about something over the 38, 39 years I've been a Christian that has helped me more than anything else. And I want to talk to you about something that's damaged me more than anything else. And it's the same thing. So my snake is my ladder today. And I want to talk to you about people. People. Now listen, what I don't want you to do is look at your friends and go, snake, ladder, snake, ladder, snake, snake, ladder, ladder. Don't do that. So we're not talking about them as individuals, um, but we are, we are talking about is the effect they have on you. Let me say this. You are naive beyond measure if you do not appreciate everybody has an effect on you. And yet our goal as Christians in discipleship, in learning and growing, is to look at who is having an effect on me and why they're having an effect on me and how is that working out for me. Because you can have a negative effect on people and you can have a positive effect on people. So we're going to look at the whole subject of people. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says this, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Well, that's a good effect. There will be people in your world that sharpen you. You come out thinking, I feel better as a Christian. I feel like clearer in my thinking. I feel more empowered. Well, there's also going to be people in your world that have the opposite effect. In the Old Testament, there's a man called Job, and he did not marry well. He had a wife, and he was struggling with things that were happening, and, and he sat basically struggling with health issues, and this is what Job's wife said to him. What a lovely wife. What a lovely counsellor she was. Job 2 verse 9. His wife said to him, Are you still maintaining your integrity? Why don't you curse God and die? <laughs> Let me tell you, that was, that was not good advice, was it? So there's people in our world that have opinions to us. And that question we're going to ask this morning is, Who are the people that you are listening to? Who are the people that you are listening to? Because 1 Corinthians 15 says this, bad company corrupts good character. So we have to be the kind of people who, who have an audit of the voices into our world. Now, we're not talking about individuals being bad people. We're not calling people snakes this morning. But we are looking at the effect 
effects of those people in our world? Do they take us forward or do they take us back? Because my experience of 39 years of being a Christian is this. I've met some people that have taken me forward and I've met some people that have had an effect on me that have taken me back. Now, this is going to be the miracle part of this message because it's 10 things you need to ask about the people you listen to. And you know me, I very rarely get through three. So 10, we're going to need the Lord to help us. So I'm going to ask you 10 questions that I don't want you to ask to answer to me. But you need to ask them to yourself and answer them to in, in your own world about 10 things about the people that you listen to. Are you ready? Now, Chris' case, I'm going to give you, because I will get lost in minute, whether I'm on five or seven or eight, so you have to count me in, right, to keep me on track of what number I'm on. Two. <laughs> Two. Um, don't go near people that are flippant with their senior pastor. And then, no, no, that's not... No, no, no. Number one is this. Is what they are talking to me about working for them? Is what they are talking to me about working for them. Hebrews 13 verse 7 says this. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way in life and imitate their faith. So this passage of scripture is all we're talking about. Think about people. And I'm not talking about just leadership, formal leadership. I'm talking about people that have leadership in your world through the words they say. So think about people that have a voice into your world, and this is what we should do. We should consider the outcome of their way of life to see first, has it worked for them? I'm not listening to you about my marriage if you've been divorced 15 times. I'm not listening to you about my finances if you've been bankrupt 55 times and you've never made a dime. So I want to know, has what you have believed worked in your life before you start peddling on me? Now, now we've got to look at people and say, if they're going to offer us advice, if they're going to speak into our world, have they got a breakthrough in that area? Have they got some wisdom in that area? How has it worked for them? I don't want people t teaching kids about when all their kids are in prison. Now, there's no perfect people in kings. There's no perfect leaders in kings. There's no perfect voices. But we have got to look at who are speaking into our worlds. What are they saying? And does it work for them? Because if it doesn't work for them, then you know what? I don't think we should be listening to that advice. So I want, I'm looking at people when they're talking to me. That's why I want to find people that are doing better than me. And people that are doing better than me in different areas and sit and listen. Say, how do you do that? How did you do this? Why did you do that? How did you structure that? How do you pray? How do you lead? I want to be better. But you've got to listen to people that have a positive voice. So that's number one. Is what they are talking to me about working for them? Good advice. Number two. Do they tell me what I want to hear? Or do they tell me the truth? Proverbs 27 verse 6 says this, The wounds from a friend can be trusted, but the enemy multiplies kisses. Let me say this, don't trust anybody that just kisses your body. Listen, I love encouragement, do you? I love it when people say, Pastor Derek, that was awesome this morning. I feel like I've been to heaven and back. We, we all love en encouragement and we, we, we do that. We do that. But you know, also, we, we also need people that love us enough to tell us the truth. I think one of the best gifts to you is, is, is marriage because Georgina tells me the truth. And sometimes I'll think I've done something and she'll say, oh, you could have done that better or maybe you shouldn't have said it like that or, or, or you really smashed it out of the park this morning and sometimes, very rarely, she'll say, I think you missed it. How dare she say that to me? I think you missed it. But we've got to have people in our world that tell us the truth, not just what we want to hear. Otherwise, we will just be, keep, be build an echo chamber of, of positivity, which positivity in itself is, is not wrong. But if it's all just people saying the same things, and we want people to love us, and they say, stay 
that weren't great. And I'm not talking about what you do. I'm maybe talking about an aspect of your life. How you're bringing your kids up, what you're spending your money on. How you treat somebody. Is that a good move for you in your career where you are? And, 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 and I want to be, have, be, have friends in my world that will sit me down and say, Derek, can I just talk to you about that for a few minutes? Can we talk about what you said, what you did? And, and thankfully, I have people in my world, but, but who's in your world that loves you enough to tell you that stinks? That attitude sucks. And if you haven't got anybody, let me tell you this, you're in trouble. Because we all need people that bring a voice into our world, not to crush us, not to put us in our place, not to get one over us, but love us enough. To tell us the truth. To hold a mirror up to our behaviour, our our attitudes. Because you know what? I don't know about you. I can only talk about me. But in the 39 years I've been a Christian, my attitude hasn't always been great. I have never backslid. I've never had an affair. I've never run away with the offering. I've never gone away from God. But I've gone cold on many occasions. I've gone cold as a pastor sometimes. Where I've had to dig deep and find, and I've valued people that in those moments in my life have come in. So, do they tell you what you want to hear or do they tell you the truth? Number three, do the people I listen to speak from a place of wisdom or their own hurts? Let me say that again because that's good. Do the people I listen to speak from a place of wisdom? Or their own hurts. Proverbs 12 verse 18 says this. The words of the reckless pierce like a sword. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. And sometimes we have to evaluate the voices that are coming into our world. Are people speaking from a place of wisdom? Or are they speaking just from their own hurts? I don't know about you. And and it's probably just me. I've been in church 39 years. Have you ever been hurt by a Christian? Have you ever been hurt in church? Have you ever been hurt by another brother and sister, what they said or what they did or what they didn't do, and you've been hurt? Well, listen, if you don't know how to manage that hurt, what will happen is eventually you'll speak from that hurt. And you'll start to, start to allow that hurt to shape you, shape your thinking, and shape your speech. So instead of speaking wisdom, you're speaking from your hurt. And you need massive discernment and understanding because sometimes people that speak from a hurt masquerade it as wisdom. This is how it was for me. And, and we've got to be so cautious that we don't allow voices into our world that are just speaking from their own hurt because hurt people, let me say that again, hurt people, for everybody's in bed at home watching it because you couldn't get up, hurt people, I heard you. Number four. Oh, four for Chris, was that four? He's paying attention, that's good. Are the people I listen to motivated by love for me or control over me? That's a big question. Are the voices I listen to motivated of love for me or control over me? In 1 Samuel chapter 19, verse 10, it says this. Saul tried to pin David to the wall with his spear. But David eluded him as Saul drove the spear into the wall. That night, David made good his escape. I'm glad he did. Me too. I'd be with him. And in this whole story, we haven't got a chance to go into it today, about the whole story of of Saul and and David, that Saul was the king of Israel. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 9, the Bible says, he was head and shoulders above every other man of his day without equal amongst the men of Israel. And, and, And part of his journey, even though he was the king, he came across David, who was just a shepherd boy. But but God had anointed David because the anointed had gone off Saul. And so David and Saul got into this really nasty relationship where where Saul, though he loved David in the beginning, ended up wanting to pin him to the wall with a spear. And we've got to be 
careful in the voices that we listen to that are the voices motivated by love for us or control over us. Let me say this. You can have controlling voices within your own family. And they're not, they're, they're, they're not trying to release you. They're trying to put their lid on you. Because they don't want you to thrive, though they would never word it like that. They don't want you to thrive because you thriving makes them look bad. And you, you succeeding makes them look like, well, why haven't I succeeded? And we have to audit the voices that we listen to in our world. Are they motiv uh, motivated by love or control? Number five. Do I really listen to other people or do I just give the appearance of listening? Proverbs 18 verse 2 says this, Fools find no pleasure in understanding but delight in airing their own opinions. I will give a free coffee at the coffee shop to anybody that could put their hand up and tell me what pediology is, the study of. Three, two, three. Oh, oh, Sarah, put her hand up, Sarah. Children, no. <laughs> Pediology is the study of soil. When I was a landscape gardener, about 140 years ago, or before that, when I went to the Lancashire School of Horticulture, every Monday morning we had 90 minutes on pediology, where we studied soil. 90 minutes every week, for a full year. I reckon that's about 50 hours studying soil. Can you imagine how exciting some of those lectures were? I can remember Mr. Wiseman, uh, uh, one of the old lecturers, he'd shuffle into the... And, and he'd open your... Open, and he'll say, open your Bibles. It weren't like that. Uh, open your workbooks, right hand. And we'd talk about soil. We're talking about lime in soil and alkaline in soil. We're talking about texture in soil. We're talking about this and that and the other. For... For 50 hours, pedology is the study of soil. And I learned in those lectures how to look interested asleep. <laughs> and I learned this technique that I'm going to share to you for every time Phil Harrison's preaching. No, I'm joking, I'm joking. For every time you've got a boring preacher. I used to put my hand on the desk like that. And my chin on my hand. The other one underneath keeping it all safe. And I just used to, and I realised I could sleep with my eyes open. Because <laughs> 50 hours on soil, listen, it got pretty boring. The first one was all right. But 50 hours on soil got a little bit boring. Listen, do you listen to people or do you just pretend to listen to people? Now, you should never listen to everybody. But the voices you've allowed in your world, do you listen or have you just created this, this thing that it looks like you're listening, but you don't? Fools find no pleasure in understanding, but delight in their own opinions. Number six, how do I process advice after it is given to me? That's a good question. Proverbs 24 verse 6 says this, Surely you need guidance to wage war, and victory is won through many advisors. I think the authorised version says um, victory is won through a multitude of counsellors. In other words, advice is a good thing to seek, and advice is as good as the person that is giving it. You can have a bad advice, you can have good advice. But how do you process it after it's given? Do you, do you weigh it? Do you think about it? Or, or do you just immediately do what anybody's asked you to do, where you're like a spinning top of people's opinion? So this person says, do this, and you do that, and then this person, and you've never really generated, what's my own mind on it? You see, the most important thing that you do is listen, process, and then come to your own conclusion. What do I believe on this? So Georgina this morning talked in, 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 in the offering. But you know, the most important thing is this. What do you believe about it? Because you will do what you believe. You can listen to many, many voices, but how you process things. 
And I love the fact that, that, that we get opportunities to, to think about it. That's why when you come to church, can I suggest, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that you bring a journal and you jot stuff down now and again. So that when you go home, you open up and say, oh, what did he say? He said this. What do you think about that, Barbara? And you have a conversation over stuff as you come to what you believe. Because the fruit of your life won't be what I believe for you. It will be what you believe for you. Yeah. That's the fruit of your life. I, I, I can only have the fruit for what I believe. For what me and Georgina and our family, you're living in the fruit of what you believe. So how do you process advice if it's given? And sometimes, you know, getting wisdom from others. And can, can I share this with you? Have you got any thoughts on it? What would you do in this situation and get advice and help from a multitude of people, but also people that have got a breakthrough, as I've already said, in that area? Number seven is this. I'm cracking through this really well. Do the people I am talking, uh, sorry, do the people I am talking to just talk a good game or do they have a track record of success? This is a little bit different from the first one. Do they have a track record of success? At the staff meeting this week, um, I read, uh, well, we, we, we looked at the whole 1 Samuel chapter 17, the story of David and Goliath. And I got all the staff to split into groups. And they all read the whole chapter about David and Goliath, and you know, you know the story. And, uh, and then we, we were asking the questions after, what one thing or two things from that story really stick out to you? And they, and they were, were sharing ideas of what was sticking out for them and what they, what they were thinking about. And I remember being in a, a group years ago with a few people that were talking about this, and a lady said, isn't it incredible that, that David went from zero to hero? He went from nothing to something. And I'm thinking to myself, that's not right. David didn't go from nothing to something, zero to hero, because when David went up to take Eliab, his older brother, the, the, you know, his packed lunch, and heard Goliath shout, and went to Saul and said, who's fighting this dude? Because if nobody else will, I will. It wasn't he went from zero to hero. Because he said to Saul, looking after my father's sheep, I've killed a lion and I've killed a bear. And this uncircumcised sucker is going the same way. That's the Derek Smith version, all right. In other words, this is what I've done. I've got a track record of success at killing things that attach the sheep. Now I'm upping it so where Goliath is attack, attacking God's sheep, his people, and he's going the way the lion and the bear did. You know, we've got to be so careful to understand this, that most of your battles have to be won privately before they're won publicly. And often we do, and you know, a lady, which I, I, I love aspiration in church. I, I love aspiration for spiritual things. I don't think it's a negative thing. A lady came to me after Rachel Marston preached last Sunday. A younger lady, and she said, I, I, really, I really love what Rachel, I, I would love to do that. No, I don't think that's, I didn't say, oh, you arrogant person. No, I love that aspiration. The Bible says, he, he who desires governance desires a good thing. I love that. But what you've also got to realise is this. You don't just do what she does. You've got to do what she did. And we've got to realise, for David to beat Goliath, he learnt it when nobody was watching, when he killed the bear. If he'd have run off from the bear, oh, there's a bear. I'm not, not, I'm not risking my life for somebody else's sheep. Jog on. I'm out of here. You can have the sheep. I'm not risking my life. And there's a lion. I'm not fighting a lion with a piece of stick. I'm not doing that. Well, you know what happened? The day came when he would faced Goliath with no track record of success. He hadn't done the hard yards. And let me tell you about being a follower of Jesus. Most of it's hard yards. Now, nobody's watching and nobody's giving you a round of applause, and nobody's putting a medal around your neck, you're just doing it privately, it's hard work, you're dealing with your own sin, you're dealing with you're managing your own perceptions, and it's all done while nobody else is looking, and then once you've nailed it there, God then starts to uh, maybe use you in areas where it is public. 
Let me say this, and I can say this in my context, and I hope you don't feel, I'm not, I'm, I'm not a big head. I'm, believe me, I'm not. You see 1% of my ministry. Maybe 2. 2%. And all the stuff that's behind the scenes. Georgina probably sees 50% of it, maybe more. But there's a whole group thing where I'm fighting in my thinking, in my learning, in my understanding, in my dealing with stuff, in moving on, in repenting, in forgiving, in forgiving others, in not getting stuck. And nobody's ever given me a round of applause for that. You get a round of applause. No, no, don't worry. Nobody gives you a round of applause. They give you a round of applause if you write a book or write a song or do something on a stage or da-da. And there's nothing wrong in that. But let me tell you this. Heaven. Let me tell you about heaven. Gives you a round of applause for what you did in secret, in pain, when nobody was watching. The whole of heaven applauds. Applauds. So you've got to win some battles privately. You've got to win some battles privately. I remember years ago, I was at the previous church, BPC, before it was called The Bridge, and uh, um, we, we used to go on the precinct every month. Looking back, I think it was pretty shocking. We used to have this van called the Turning Point Trailer. We used to pull it into Bolton Town Centre, and then we'd get a mic, and we'd just shout at people. And... Um, now listen, it, we did a lot of good stuff and, 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 and we'd stand there on a Sunday afternoon and, and the, the people that were leading, I'm trying to keep names out of this, although you won't do any of I'd give you the mic and you'd come to the mic and you'd say, Hi, I'm Derek. I want to tell you what Jesus has done for me and there's people walking past and you'd get the odd person shout out and you'd get, you'd get some wise comment and then you'd get a drunk dancing and, you know, you got, it was like... It, so, and, and we'd kind of do and we'd go and we'd give it on the precincts and we'd go and we'd preach and we'd do different things. And uh, I remember being in church and there was a guy who went to his funeral last year called Walter Owen. Some of you may remember Walter. And I remember one of my mates went to him and I was there and uh, he sat in Walter's house because we used to go to see Walter, a few of the younger lads, and just share, he'd share some stuff with us. And my mate said to him, he said, Walter, I want to be, I feel God's telling me I'm going to be an international evangelist. I feel God showed me I'm going to preach across the nations. I feel God's going to do this, I feel God's going to do that. And Walter, so wise, never got carried away. Not very Pentecostal, but a great man of God. Said this to him, took a deep breath and said, that's wonderful. See you on the precinct next Saturday. But we don't want to start there. We don't want to start with people throwing milkshake at you. And when I went on ace teams, I've got some stories. I did three years itinerant training, and I've got some stories. We were spat on. We were thrown. We, I preached once in a pub, and a fight started, and it all spilled out. And I, I was driving the boss's car. He had a blue Nissan. He had a blue Nissan Bluebird, and we parked it outside the pub. And the fight came out, and there were lads fighting on the bonnet of my boss's car. And I'm thinking, what on earth is happening here? This does not feel like evangelism. This feels like Dante's Inferno. But let me tell you, you know where all your major victories for your future are won? Privately. And you are living the result of your private victories. You've got a track record. When you go for a job interview... What you do, you bring out your portfolio and it says, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this, therefore I am qualified to do this. Let me tell you, there's sometimes in church life and in your Christian life where you have to look at this challenge you have in front of you and you can say, I've done this and I've done this and I've done this and I am qualified to deal with this. The trouble is we want to miss out that and get to the miraculous bits. There's no shortcuts. Christianity is 99.9% just hard work of dealing with ourselves, with others, and loving God. And I want to tell you, it's worth it. Chris, what number am I on? Eight. Eight. 
Number eight is this. Does the advice I listen to have grounding in God's word or is it just their opinion? I love this. Acts 17, verse 11, this is this. Now the Berean Jews were more noble, or, or a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. For they received the message with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. I love that, that they listened to Paul and then they went away and they, they, they got their Torahs out, which was the first Bible, and they're looking at what, what the scriptures said, what... And then they're looking at what Paul said, and they're looking at the scriptures, they're looking on. They're not taking anything just on face value, but they are searching the scriptures. And you know, let me say, we need the discernment, as I talked about a few weeks, to do that. Not everything that's preached in every church is right. You need to go, is that right? I just need to think about that. I want to go back and read my Bible. You know that scripture that you just mentioned this morning? And I would encourage you. And if I've done these 10 things and didn't bring notes, if you ask me, I'll send you a copy of all the 10 points and go away and pray over them and think about them and make your own decision if what I'm saying to is right for you. Because the heart can't rejoice in what the mind rejects. Does it have a grounding in God's word? Is it biblically based? Because we are living in days where so much that's coming from Sometimes, sadly, even Pentecostal pulpits is not biblically based. It's shaped by culture. It's shaped by what we feel will fly in today's culture. I know I tell you, if you're part of King's Church, we're sticking to the Word of God. And if it's popular, it's okay. And if it's not, that's okay too. So what we're doing, and, and when we we're just going to do that. Why? Because when we start lowering the standard of this to just fit in with what everybody else thinks, we're doomed. We're doomed. And the biggest challenge facing the church is not rabid atheists. We know how to deal with them. It's people who say they're followers of Jesus that think they know better than God. We don't have to believe that anymore. Yeah, Marriage, man and woman. Yeah, well, you know, well, we got, well, this, yeah, we don't, yeah, women in leadership, yeah, we, all those kinds of things. No, we're sticking to scripture. Thank you. And if you love it, you're welcome to stay. But we love the Bible and we want to preach the Bible. Number nine. When I disagree with people giving me advice, do they sulk, isolate me? Or do they stay consistent? I love that. Colossians 3, 13 and 14 says this. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If anyone you has a grievance against somebody, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. You've, you've got to be careful with people that offer you advice. And if you don't do what they say, they sulk, isolate you. You've got to rejoice over people that give you advice and if you take it, you take it. Well, you know what? They're still your fans. They still believe in, in God for you. Because those kind of people, that's not great leadership to sulk at people. It's not great followership to sulk at people. And we need to just ask ourselves that question. When I disagree with the people giving my advice, what do they do? Because that tells us about their character. And number 10, and we made it at four minutes past 12. Number 10. I'm at number 10, Chris, just confirming. Number 10. Are the voices I am listening to taking me forward into my future or are they keeping me stuck in my past? A few weeks ago, we did a series called Wholehearted where we talked about Caleb from the book of Numbers. Ooh. He's had a shooting pain. And, um, and, um, and we're talking about Caleb from the book of Numbers. And one of the things that we, we said about Caleb and we love about Caleb is this, that he wasn't stuck in the past. He looked to the future, he spied out the 
the promised land and was obsessed with, with where the children of Israel could go when all the other voices around him said, no, we can't do that. Let's stay here. Or even let's go back to Egypt. Let's stay here. And you've got the question in auditing the voices in your world. Are the people speaking into you wanting you to go somewhere in God? Or are they trying to take you back? Are they, are they trying to get you stuck? Or are these voices really, really liberating you? I don't want to be stuck in my past. I want to honor the past. I want to honor the past. I want to live in the present. But I want to move into the future. And um, I think my mate Glenn Barrett often says this in the context of moving on. He says this. Tradition is not wearing your grandfather's hat. Tradition is buying a new one, like he did. And we have got to understand that today, in the challenge of the church in 2024 and beyond, there are some significant challenges facing church right across our nation, right across our world. I've recently gone on the board at the Evangelical Alliance and uh, it's incredible to speak to people who are in the corridors of power. You know, let me encourage you, and I can't tell you everything, but there are key born-again, spirit-filled Christians in the corridors of power in our country who are not compromising, who are speaking truth, who are in, in the ear of politicians and being part of things that are shaping culture. It's not all bad news. Though if you watched the political debates this week, they were bad news. They were like kids in a school playground. Well, listen, we know ultimate change is this. There's only one person going to change our nation, and he's called Jesus. And he's not going to do it by cutting your tax. And he's not going to do it by putting a few quid on child benefit. He's going to do it, which we're going to talk about tonight, because tonight, as the launch of Kings Warrington, I'm going to talk about the state of the nation, and we're going to talk about what God requires of the church in these days. But I'm so grateful that Jesus wants to change hearts. We're far more important than any politician. Far more important. Boris Johnson has nothing on me. Keir Starmer, jog on. I don't care you were in Bolton this week. Why? Because they can just put more money or less money in your pocket. But I've got a message through Jesus Christ that can change your life forever. So who are we listening to? And I finish with this, and then we're going to pray. So if the band can come and join, because I want us to sing just as we finish. If where you are today, and I'm not saying where you are, I only know where I am. If where you are today is the fruit of the voices you have listened to, are you happy? Are you content? Are you, while I'm bob on where I should be? Are you listening to the right voices? Are you listening to wise counsel of men and women of a proven track record that love the word of God, that love you enough to tell you the truth, and love you enough to want to see you thrive, not controlled. That look at you and think, wow, what a brilliant future. Not what a great past. So I'm going to pray. And we're just going to simply pray. We're going to sing. And then Phil is going to come and just land the service. So this is my, this is my prayer. In all the voices in my head, that's what I'm going to pray for in a minute, all the voices in my head, may I audit what's you. And may I also audit the voice of God 
who it comes through. Father God, thank you for these beautiful people here this morning. Thank you, God, for everything that you are doing, seen and unseen. Just help us now, Lord, in all our thinking to just... God, people are not snakes. We know that. People are not ladders. But what they say either takes us forward or backwards. And I just pray that as we conclude this series of Snakes and Ladders, that you'll help us consistently look at the voices that are shaping our world. God, we want to be fruitful. We want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. God, tonight as we open Kings Warrington, God, we're praying your kingdom will come and your will be done. We just ask God that we, in these days, we will not shrink back, we'll not think small, but we'll be brave, we'll be confident to be men and women who know their God and do exploits. Thank you for one another. Thank you for your word. We just pray now as we sing together that God, you'll put a seal on this message. In Jesus' name.